Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first episode of Soldiers of Honor. Thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, today's episode is a man by the name of Roy Benavidez. Now, Roy Benavidez is one seriously bad dude. Roy's pretty much gotten the short end of the stick his entire life. Um, and in this very short 10-minute podcast, I will attempt to do my best at telling the story that earned him the Medal of Honor. However, I would encourage you to go online and do your own research or buy one of his very many autobiographies that he wrote about the rest of his life because he was a pretty amazing person. Uh, but anyway, this is my take on it, and I hope you enjoy. Roy Perez Benavidez was born on August 5, 1935 in South Texas. His father, Salvador Benavidez, was a Mexican-American farmer, and his mother, Teresa Perez, was a Yaqui Indian. When Roy was just two years old, his father died of tuberculosis, and just five years after that, his mother also died of tuberculosis. As a result, Roy and his younger brother were forced to move to El Campo to be raised by his aunt and uncle, along with their eight cousins. Roy worked hard as a child. He had various jobs working on farms in California and Washington. He shined shoes and even worked for a tire shop. His schooling was off and on, and at the age of 15, Roy dropped out to work full-time to support his family. His love for his country, however, brought him to enlist in the Texas Army National Guard at just 17 years of age. He joined the United States Army in 1955 and married in 1959. That same year, Roy completed his training in the Army and joined the 82nd Airborne Division. During his first tour in Vietnam, Roy stepped on a landmine. The explosion nearly took Roy's leg off, and when he was evacuated to a hospital in Texas, doctors told him that he would never walk again. Roy recounted later being stunned by this diagnosis and kind of pissed off. He was so disgusted by the protests, the flag burnings, and the media criticism regarding the United States and Vietnam that he decided to rehabilitate himself to get back into the fight. Roy was at the hospital for over a year, and against his doctor's orders, Roy would get out of bed at night using his elbows and chin and would crawl his way to a wall in an attempt to stand. His fellow patients, many of whom were amputees or paralyzed, would cheer him on to keep going. This went on for months of painful agony. Roy himself even admitted this practice often ended with him in tears. Nevertheless, one year later, in 1966, Roy walked out of that hospital with his wife by his side. His pain would never fully subside, but Roy was determined to get back in the fight. But, before he did, Roy decided he needed a better hat. A Green Beret, in fact. After a short period of training, he joined up with the elite 5th Special Forces Group. In January of 1968, Roy returned to Vietnam for his second tour. Five months later, on the 22nd of May, he was attending a Catholic prayer service at an outpost when he heard a desperate plea over the radio. The call came from a 12-man special forces team that was surrounded and pinned down in a section of thick jungle by over 1,000 North Vietnamese soldiers. Three different choppers had already attempted a rescue, but they were forced to retreat due to unrelenting small arms fire. Roy had no orders to get involved, but ran out of that tent and into the chopper so fast that he forgot to grab a gun. Armed with a bowie knife and a medical bag, he headed out to save his comrades. Upon reaching the destination, intense enemy fire prohibited the chopper from landing. Hovering ten feet off the ground, Roy made the Catholic sign of the cross on his chest and jumped. Over 75 yards away, Roy sprinted toward his fellow warriors. Within seconds, he was hit by an AK-47 slug and collapsed to the ground. Convinced it was just a thorn bush, he quickly jumped to his feet and was immediately thrown to the side like a rag doll from a nearby hand grenade that shredded his face, back, and neck. Unwilling to stay down, Roy said a prayer out loud while he stumbled to his feet and continued to the injured squad. The squad was split into two groups, and upon reaching them, he counted four dead and eight wounded. Roy bound their wounds as best he could, injected morphine, passed around ammunition he had taken from dead enemy soldiers, and armed himself with his own AK. Roy took control of the field radio and began calling in and directing airstrikes. He also called in another rescue chopper near the second group of men, and in doing so, received a second gunshot wound to his right thigh. Roy was not too terribly bothered by his condition, and began dragging the dead and wounded to the chopper, all while providing covering fire with his rifle. As the enemy bullets increased, the chopper hovered over Roy to move to another position. He slowly followed underneath, 
firing his rifle as he went. As the helicopter reached its destination, Roy spotted the team leader, Sergeant First Class Wright. Without thinking, Roy charged over to the sergeant, and, realizing he was gone, retrieved the pouch of classified papers dangling from the sergeant's neck. Immediately, upon pocketing the documents, Roy was simultaneously shot in the stomach and blown away with a grenade shredding his back. Lying in pain and covered in wounds, he looked over to see the rescue helicopter crash to the ground. Roy decided his wounds were of no real concern and, spitting out a mouthful of blood, jumped to his feet to pull his comrades from the wreckage. He quickly organized a small perimeter around the fallen chopper and began passing out ammunition gathered from the dead. Luckily, the airstrikes Roy had called in earlier had finally arrived, and they began wreaking havoc on the enemy. He continued to tend to the wounded, and one soldier asked him, Are you hurt bad, Sarge? No doubt, on the verge of collapsing from massive blood loss, Roy replied, Hell no! I've been hit so many times, I don't give a damn no more. Roy continued to encourage the injured soldiers to fight on. The mortar shells were bursting all around them, and the enemy fire peppered every inch of their perimeter. Several wounded warriors were hit again, along with Roy. With blood streaming down his face so heavily that he was blinded, Roy continued to call in airstrikes, adjusting his targets by sound alone. On multiple occasions, radio silence would leave the pilots thinking Roy was dead, but his voice would come back on shortly after, demanding closer airstrikes. After six hours of struggle, a helicopter finally landed to escort the wounded to safety. Roy helped each soldier to board the chopper, and while he was carrying a wounded comrade, a fallen North Vietnamese soldier jumped up and clubbed the back of Roy's head with his rifle. Roy fell and rolled over just in time to catch a bayonet headed for his chest. Grabbing the assailant's blade with his right hand, Roy pulled his knife with his left and stabbed the attacker. This resulted in his right hand being shredded and his forearm stabbed clean through by the bayonet. By some divine power, Roy picked up his wounded comrade again and placed him in the chopper. Turning to make one last trip, two more adversaries appeared from out of the jungle. Roy quickly snatched a rifle from a fallen soldier and dispatched both the aggressors in rapid succession. Returning with one last soldier, a Vietnamese interpreter, Roy decided he had finally done enough. He was pulled into the chopper and propped upright near a wounded staff sergeant. He held the hand of his comrade tightly, and in the other hand, he held the intestines that were trying to make their way through his stomach. When they arrived at the hospital, Roy was immobile and unresponsive. He was covered in blood, bullet holes, stab wounds, and shrapnel. He had voluntarily risked his life to help save the lives of 12 fellow soldiers without any concern for his own well-being. At around 8 p.m. on May 2, 1968, medics placed Roy in a body bag and carried him over to lay with his fallen comrades. When they went to zip up the bag, however, Roy spit up in the doctor's face as if to say, Hey! I ain't dead yet! No doubt stunned, the doctors didn't think there was any way that Roy would survive. They were wrong. Roy spent almost a year recovering in and out of hospitals. He had been shot seven times, took 28 chunks of shrapnel, and both arms had been stabbed. He had shrapnel in his head, scalp, shoulder, butt, feet, and legs. His right lung was completely destroyed, and his mouth was injured from a rifle butt. One of the bullets went straight through his back and exited just below his heart. There was absolutely no reason that Roy should have lived, but he did. His commander felt that he deserved the Medal of Honor, but knowing it would be a long process and afraid that Roy wouldn't live much longer, the commander instead nominated Roy for the Distinguished Service Cross. It was rushed through the proper channels, and on September 10, 1968, he received his medal. Years later, the commander learned that Roy did not die, and was in fact alive and well. After hearing this news, he put Roy up for the Medal of Honor, and finally, in 1981, he was awarded the highest military recognition. Before reading his official citation, President Reagan said, You are going to hear something you would not believe if it were scripted. Humble to the very end, Roy never considered himself a hero. He was quoted in saying, The real heroes are the ones who gave their lives for their country. I don't like to be called a hero, I just did what I was trained to do. But Roy was a hero, and upon retirement, he was a part of the Medal of Honor Society, Legion of Valor, Veterans of Foreign War, Special Ops Association, Special Forces Association, and countless other organizations. He spoke at schools and runaway shelters. He promoted patriotism, education, and a drug-free life. 
He currently has three elementary schools named after him, a youth boot camp, a park, and a U.S. Navy ship. Before he passed, Roy told his son, never bring shame on our family name. Master Sergeant Roy Benavidez died at the age of 63 on November 29, 1998, due to respiratory failure, which was no doubt a direct result of the injuries he sustained in battle. He is buried at the Fort Sam Houston National Cemetery in Texas. <laughs>